Excellencies, distinguished delegates, participants, and dear colleagues, a very good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on your time zones. My name is Pınar Karakaya. I'm working as an economist at the FAO Liaison Office in Geneva, and I will be moderating the session on behalf of my director, Dominique Bourgeon, who unfortunately could not join us today. First of all, I would like to thank you for taking the time to attend our session today, given the busy agenda of Geneva in the midst of preparations for the 13th Ministerial Conference of the WTO, known as MC13. We appreciate your support and interest in FAO's work. As you may already know, FAO in Geneva is organizing series of trade dialogues in collaboration with FAO's Markets and Trade Division and FAO's Fisheries and Aquaculture Division. Through these series, our objective is to share information on relevant and timely topics related to agriculture and fisheries. In December last year, FAO published six trade policy briefs, FAO support to the WTO negotiations at the 13th Ministerial Conference on a range of topics, including fisheries, cotton, food safety, environmental provisions in regional trade agreements and price transmission. Considering that MC13 will take place at the end of next month, today's information session will provide an opportunity to present the trade policy briefs and also to inform about the technical support available from FAO, including data, tools, analysis, and other technical support in line with FAO's mandates. Before starting the session, I would like to share some details regarding the logistics and housekeeping for this virtual session. This session will be in English only with no interpretation. It will be recorded and will be shared with the participants along with the various related resources relevant to this session. This session is scheduled to last around 40 minutes. We have reserved some time for questions towards the end. So please submit your questions in the Q&A module. While doing so, kindly state your name and organization or institution. We will try to accommodate as many requests as possible, either writing or orally during the session as the time permits. That's all for housekeeping issues. Now let me, our, uh, let me introduce our speakers. Today, we are very pleased to have our FAO colleagues joining us from Rome. Mr. Odin Lam. Odin is Deputy Director at FAO's Fisheries and Aquaculture Division. Mr. Georgios Mermikas. Georgios is Senior Economist at FAO's Markets and Trade Division. Mr. Fabio Palmeri. Fabio is Statistical Research Assistant at FAO's Markets and Trade Division. Mr. Cosimo Avaseni. Cosimo is Trade Policy Analyst at FAO's Markets and Trade Division. Ms. Karolina Kozlowska. Karolina is Econometrics Expert at FAO's Markets and Trade Division. And Mr. Vittorio Pattori. Vittorio is Food Safety and Quality Officer at FAO's Agri-Food Systems and Food Safety Division. Without taking much time, now I would like to give the floor to Georgios. Georgios will set the background and provide a brief introduction on the work of FAO's markets and trade division. Please, Georgios, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Pinar, for uh, giving the floor. Thank you very much for organizing this event. And it is a real pleasure for me to be here and to see actually how strong the interest is on FAO's work uh, on trade. Uh, allow me very briefly to give uh, some information on what uh, the trade and markets, the markets and trade division of FAO does, and how this can, uh, how this work is relevant for the uh, Geneva environment and for the delegates in Geneva in their effort to, in their work within the WTO proceedings. Uh, if I, I would say that our work on trade and markets, on trade in particular, it is it can be con it is conducted in three main tracks. One is uh, the preparation of evidence, building evidence. The second is organization of dialogues away from the negotiating table in a neutral and impartial way. And of course, the third has to do, it's a very common activity in FAO, it's the capacity development activities. With regard to the first one, uh, the six policy briefs that uh, Pinar referred to and which are the subject of this event today, I constitute part of this effort, uh, building uh, evidence, informing the negotiations, uh, giving, uh, pro so providing support to the negotiators in Geneva or to the delegates in Geneva on what is happening in global trade issues. This is a good example, of course. We have other important uh, publications uh, that it could be consulted 
Uh, the division is responsible for one of the FAO's flagship reports, reports the, commit, the State of Commodity Markets, the so-called SOCO report, which is published every two years. The next uh, edition will be available in September, will be released in September. And it is on the topics of trade and nutrition, which is a very interesting and very topical issue. Uh, of course, we have ad hoc publications on trade. Uh, we have been working recently on... Uh, uh, environmental related provisions in regional trade agreements. Some reports will be published soon as well. Uh, and of course, we have work uh, on markets. Uh, we have the high profile publication of the medium term outlook, a joint FAO ECD publication uh, ev that every year looks at the baseline projections for the next decade uh, for major commodities uh, and trade, uh, production, yields, uh, everything, food security. So, uh, it is something that gives uh, the set the scene of how things might uh, develop in the next uh, 10 years. We have the food outlook, which um, it, relating to the medium term out outlook that I mentioned before, the food outlook provides short term uh, projections for major food commodities. commodities. And of course, probably uh, the colleagues in Geneva, they know very well, the FAO food price index who shows how prices are developing uh, globally. All of this we, are, we use when we provide our submissions to the WTO Committee on Agriculture, regular submissions, FAO as an observer to the committee. So I, I would invite all the delegates to, to read our submissions to see what the situation is and of course to visit also our website where the FAO, the Markets and Trade Division website where they can find all the information and all the publications. Apart from this track, which is evidence building, as I said before, we have another track of work, which is a dialogue events in an impartial way. This is a very good example of that. And on that, uh, also, we work very well and very closely with the Geneva office. And I would like to thank Pinar on that, uh, where we organize quite often uh, events that are of relevance for the Geneva environment, including the, the something that has been established now as an institution in Geneva, the Geneva Trade Talks, where probably all the delegates here today have uh, had the chance in the past to participate. And of course, uh, the, the last, the third track of work is capacity development. In uh, FAO, we have developed uh, some uh, e-learning courses, uh, of course, apart from the work that we do at the country level, something that could be relevant for the delegates in Geneva. We have developed some e-learning courses, two main e-learning courses. One is on trade, food security, and nutrition and the other is on agricultural international trade agreements. This can be found in the FAO e-learning academy, as it is called. And these are free of charge, and everybody who wants can uh, uh, easily register and uh, have these courses. Odom will follow after me and will speak on fisheries, but one of them will soon have also a unit uh, on fisheries. So uh, the one on agricultural uh, trade agreements, international trade agreements. So it it co they cover a, a big spectrum of uh, the trade-related work of the delegates in Geneva, and it would be probably we consider that it would be very useful for them if they could uh, visit and do uh, self-paced courses that they can do when they are available uh, completely free of charge. This is the only thing that I want to uh, say, Pinar. It's a very short event. We really have to be short, all of us. So I hope that covers the work of FAO Markets and Trade Division. And I'm here if anything clarification is required. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much, Georgios, for your remarks. Indeed, it was a very like good summary of what like uh, Markets and Trade Division is doing, which might be of relevance to to Geneva community here. And now we will have the presentations by the co-authors of the trade policy briefs. Uh, first, we will start with the two policy briefs on fisheries, the importance of international trade for fisheries and aquaculture products, and the WTO agreement on fisheries subsidies and the role of FAO. Now, I would like to give the floor to Odin. Uh, please, Odin, you have the floor. Well, thank you, Pinar, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I only have a few minutes, so I will just mention a few issues of few elements that, that I think are particularly important um, regarding the um, fisheries and, and or trade in fish and fisheries products, I think it's important to remember that about one third or a little bit more than one third of everything that is caught or farmed coming from aquaculture enters international trade. In fact, 37%. So that means that access to markets is incredibly important for the fisheries and aquaculture sector in the world. 
Um, developing countries play a very large and important role in production and in exports. In fact, more than 50% of all exports entering into national markets come from developing countries. And the net export revenues earned by um, developing countries is very, very important for those coming from fish and fishery products. In fact, they are about the same value as the sum of uh, net exports of, um, of poultry, beef, and a number of other um, agri, agri, agri uh, cultural uh, food products. Um, the role of small scale is very important, not only in terms of employment, but also in terms of um, of, of, of volumes on, on captures um, done by, carried out by small scale producers all over the world, not only in, in developing countries, but in fact also coastal fisheries in, uh, in developed countries is, is very important on the coast for, uh, for, local, uh, for the local economy and for lo local uh, employment. Then what about the, the state of stocks? Well, FAO, we monitor about 500, more than 500 commercial stocks all over the world and we report on the status of stocks regularly to FAO members. Uh, about two-thirds of the stocks that we follow are where they should be uh, at the uh, level of MSY, the maximum sustainable yield. However, the, uh, the trend is somewhat negative, so we have a problem of implementing uh, efficient uh, management measures in, in some areas of the world, or not FAO, but our, our members have sometimes, and therefore are, are in need of assistance. And in fact, this uh, trend, which is worsening when we are looking at the, only at the number of stocks, is of course a challenge for all of us. The good news is that the stocks that are where they should be at MSY are the most productive stocks, and in fact, produce or contribute uh, much more than Two thirds, in fact, uh, in 75 or 78 percent. I have to check the latest figures. So the trend, if you only look at the number of stocks, is a bit uh, worrying. When we look, in fact, uh, on the other, on the on the positive side, the uh, contribution coming from well-managed stocks, in fact, is is increasing in the total share of of, of supply. I also have to mention, uh, and that's the final issue on 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 the trade side or the production side, is that whereas capture fisheries uh, are a bit stable, around 90 million tons per year. Uh, the um, increase in aquaculture production is very, very promising, of course. And aquaculture has developed from uh, where it came from 20, 30 years ago to the present level of supplying more than 50% of what we as human beings consume of seafood products all over the world. So the future, of course, is not only managing better our uh, marine stocks, but also continue to develop sustainably the aquaculture sector. So th that is what I had on the importance of, of trade for fisheries and aquaculture products, market access, etc. Then what about the WTO agreement on fishery subsidies and the role of FAO? Well, our role is, of course, to provide technical capacity upon request from uh, our members, WTO members, and also the uh, WTO uh, secretariat, of course. And we do that on a number of issues related to the uh, agreement, especially the fisheries related parts of the agreement uh, in terms of stock assessments, uh, analysis, reporting, um, guidance on uh, fisheries management in general, implementation of the many tools that we have to address uh, overfishing, uh, in or illegal fishing also. So the two elements that are really standing out in the agreement, the the role of subsidies for IUU fishing is of course very relevant to us and the work we've done on, on the Port State Specialist Agreement, but a number of other instruments we have to contribute to uh, improved sustainability of capture fisheries. The role of the RFMOs, of course, we have a secretariat uh, working together with the RFMOs in, in the world. Um, and then when, when we talk about the future, well, um, our work on the methodology on, on stock assessments, of course, is important. And we do that together with our members in order to not only have better assessments, more comprehensive assessments, but also enabling countries to better manage their, their fisheries in, in a more effective and in more sustainable manner. So we are here to serve our members to uh, provide 
assistance, capacity building. So uh, please uh, do not refrain from contacting us and, and Pinar, we are there to, to assist. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Odun, uh, for the overview of these two post briefs in such a short period of time. Now I would like to give the floor to Fabio concerning the post brief on Katan. Please, Fabio, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pinar, and good afternoon, everyone. So this brief provides an overview of trade development in the cotton market over the past 20 years. It also outlines the outlook uh, of the cotton sector in the next 10 years and identifies uh, what the challenges are and what actions can be taken to address such challenges. So if Pinar, can you please upload the slide? So, um, Yes, so available data shows that uh, global trade has increased significantly over the past 20 years with an annual growth rate of 5%. And as you can read, they reached uh, a value of around 26 billion in 2022. A boost to trade in the cotton sector was provided by the implementation of the Uruguay round and the phasing out of the multi-fiber agreement. And in particular, if we look at the regional level, the Asian uh, countries have increased significantly their share of imports in the past years, reaching a value uh, corresponding to over 90% of the global cotton imports. Um, while on the export side, uh, the situation has not changed much with the US remaining as uh, the largest uh, cotton exporter followed by uh, Brazil um, and India. So projections for the next 10 years point to a further expansion on the, uh, on the cotton trade and is pulled by uh, strong demand for textile products and also the growth in Asian countries, particularly Bangladesh and Vietnam, which are uh, uh, very competitive in the textile and apparel on the sector. However, there are a number of challenges the need uh, that actually the cotton sector faces uh, in view of this growth. Uh, first one is the extent to which uh, the global economy um, will develop and will grow over the next decade. That because um, the demand for cotton is a dry demand. So, I mean, it depends on the demand for textile and apparel. So. Uh, which are income responsive. Then another issue is the um, the population growth. The slower growth in the population may affect the growth um, in uh, demand. Then there is the competition from the uh, man-made fibers, particular synthetic products, and also the recycling. And, um, and not to mention the, uh, the low level and stagnant level of retail prices in the apparel market, um, which affects margin for producers. But on this, at the same time, however, um, there is we are witnessing an increasing uh, application of sustainable standards uh, along the value chain of the cotton sector, and also uh, as a preference for among consumers for sustainable products. So while it's crucial um, to strengthen the compliance with sustainable standards um, at all levels of the value chain, it's also important to assist uh, cotton growers in, because the adoption of sustainable uh, standards, the compliance with these standards as a cost. So it's important to assist growers providing technical assistance and access to resources. At the same time, to improve um, the competitiveness of the cotton product against man-made fibers and synthetic in particular, it's important to improve the characteristic on the cotton fiber to make them more competitive. And this can be done uh, by improving cotton varieties, which is something we already are witnessing, which are improving the, the variety of cotton products and also exploiting new technology. This, of course, while ensuring trade reforms address market distorting measures. So, and regarding uh, these uh, challenges and actions and the outlook for the next uh, 10 years, I would like to remind that uh, the new outlook for cotton, as uh, George was mentioning, will be available in July uh, this year with the new projections, which point to uh, further expansion in cotton trade, as mentioned before. So with this, I thank you for your attention and I close my intervention. Thank you, Pinar. Um, thank you very much, Fabio, uh, for, for your presentation.
Now I would like to give the floor to Cosimo, who will be presenting the trade policy brief on um, environment related provisions in regional trade agreements. Please Cosimo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Pina. Um, so my name is uh, Cosimo Besani, and I'm a trade policy analyst in the trade and market division of FAO. And I'm a co-author to the brief on uh, AgriPace uh, with uh, Edona de Revisholli and Jose Solorsano Lopez. Uh, before presenting you the main points discussed in this policy brief, uh, I would like to inform you that this document is based on a much broader FAO publication that will be soon released and that we will have the honor to discuss more in depth during the IIST Sustainability Hub in Abu Dhabi, which will take place uh, at the margins of uh, MC13 on the 28th of uh, February. Uh, in a nutshell, this policy brief discusses what we defined ag ERPs, or those environmental related provisions that are linked to the agriculture, fishery, or uh, forestry sectors. Why discussing this topic? Well, uh, because more and more we are aware of the fact that uh, trade can have an impact on the environment and uh, that the agriculture, fisheries and forestry sectors need a healthy environment to strive. But of course, depending on how they're managed, they can also have positive or negative impacts on it. Now, we know that since the establishment of the uh, WTO uh, Regional Trade Agreements or RTAs have become a common option to uh, liberalize trade. RTAs have also expanded rapidly in terms of uh, regulatory coverage, making direct reference to sustainable development and including provisions linking the environment to the agriculture, fishery and forestry sectors, AGRPs. Um, as you can read in the brief, and um, you will be able to see it more in depth once the full uh, research will be released, uh, the inclusion of AGRPs in RTAs has kind of fluctuated somewhat since 1995, but the average number of such provision per agreement has increased steadily. Now, several studies show that RTAs with um, ERPs have yielded positive outcomes, and there is evidence of significant reductions in uh, agriculture-related greenhouse gases emissions in, country, in countries that have signed RTAs with more AGRPs compared to countries with less AGRPs in their RTAs. However, this topic is largely unexplored. And whether the inclusion of AGRPs in RTAs is the appropriate means for improving and expanding uh, the reach of different environmental practices globally is yet to be confirmed. We do not know enough yet. And we need to continue researching on it. And this is one of our main messages that we also include in the policy brief, to conduct and promote more research and studies on the impact of RTAs, RTAs with AGRPs, uh, to pursue uh, policy level discussions on AGRPs through, for instance, multilateral processes, and to announce in this regard cooperation at the international level. Uh, thank you very much for the attention. I just wanted to say these very simple things. Happy to reply to your questions. And of course, uh, um, for some of you that will be in uh, in Abu Dhabi, see you there. Um, thank you very much, Cosimo. Now we will hear from Carolina uh, on the post brief on price transmission. Please, Carolina, the floor is yours. Uh, okay, thank you, Pinar. Uh, could you please load the slide? Okay, so the objective of our policy brief is to answer the question of whether domestic food markets in developing countries respond to changes in international prices, and if so, how quickly. In November 2023, the FAO Food Price Index declined by nearly 25% from the all-time high reached in March 2022. However, as global food market prices declined, in many countries, domestic food prices did not follow suit. Domestic food price inflation remained high, and in real terms, it exceeded overall inflation in 127 out of 163 countries. The extent to which changes in international prices lead to changes in local prices is called price transmission, and a complete price transmission occurs when the prices of food products sold on domestic and international markets differ only by transportation costs. 
In practice, however, food prices are imperfectly transmitted between countries, at least in short term, and this is because markets need time to adjust. This is in particular the case of low-income countries, where the impact of change in international prices on their markets is either delayed or very small. And this may be due to several reasons, for instance, trade costs or trade policies, such as import tariffs or import and export restrictions. High trade costs render arbitrage very expensive and may result in partly insulating the domestic markets. The same thing happens when tariffs are very high and export bans can additionally insulate domestic markets. So in this brief, we used econometrics to carry out an empirical exercise to examine serial price transmission for four countries, Ethiopia, Mali, Peru, and South Africa. Uh, our results show that in all four countries, price shocks tend to be incompletely transmitted to domestic markets with significant delays. For example, a change in the world maize market price was transmitted to Peru in 3.7 months, while to Ethiopian market it took as much as 9.2 months. For South Africa, the wheat price took 3.7 months to adjust to change in global markets, and for rice market in Mali, it took six months. Uh, the key policy challenge that lies ahead is how to strike balance between the need to protect domestic consumers from external shocks and reaping the benefits from integrating into international markets. Policy actions to address this challenge include, first, improving trade infrastructure and enhancing trade facilitation measures to reduce trade costs. Second, in the short run, what is important is to balance policies that promote market integration with measures that can mitigate the negative effects of sudden global market shocks to domestic markets. And finally, um, what is crucial in the long run is to support trade policies that promote integration into international markets to contribute to improved food security, better nutrition, and sustainable economic growth. Um, thank you. And thank you very much, Carolina, uh, for, for, the, for the presentation. Now I would like to move to our last speaker today, um, Vittorio, who will be presenting us the paid policy brief on food safety. But before that, I would like to kindly remind you, if you have any questions, please post them on the Q&A module. And while doing so, please state your names and institutions. So please, Vittorio, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Pinar, and a good day to all the distinguished delegates. Uh, I do work in the, as Pinar has presented me, I do work in the Agri-Food System and Food Safety Division, particularly in the in the Food Safety Group here uh, at FAO. Um, and I'd, I'd like to, uh, and I'm, I've been contributed with the colleagues in, in the Trade Division on this uh, small uh, technical brief on improving food safety to foster trade. I'd like to maybe start off um, by saying uh, and recognizing the uh, food safety as a key uh, public health priority, right? It's um, the burden of foodborne disease. It's still very, very high and very, very high, particularly in some regions of the world. So protecting consumers will go through also ensuring that the safe that we eat all as consumers is safe. So that's that's for me. It's so the essential prerequisite. Then, of course, food safety is um, an integral part in achieving uh, food and nutrition security. We used to say that if say if food is not safe, we cannot consider it food. So that's another important element that to making sure that we can achieve. Uh, adequate uh, food security for all the global population, we need to make sure that food safety is there. And last but not least, food safety is important for livelihoods. Food safety is essential for, for trade. We know, uh, and you, uh, you know very well, how food safety is um, um, very important in some trade negotiation, how food safety requirements play a role in international trade. Um, so in that, in that, in aspect, in that aspect, it, food safety also has a key component uh, in terms of making sure that uh, countries can access market and can access international trade. 
In this respect, we do have a framework, as you all know, um, an international framework which is uh, set by the joint FOWHO Codex Alimentarius, which provides international uh, standards and guidelines on food safety, which are the uh, food safety benchmark uh, under the WTO SPS agreement. Um, and so we do have a, a framework uh, that allow us to make sure that on the one hand, we protect consumer health, uh, and on the other hand, we facilitate uh, an harmonized uh, trade um, flow. Um, in the brief, as you may have read, we have flagged um, some uh, um, potential issues that we are seeing in the world of food safety and with, rele with relevance to, 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 to trade. But we are also trying to offer some solutions. So not only <laughs> posing problems or issues, but also come forward with a positive attitude of some solutions. And, uh, and we believe at FAO, we know uh, what actions needs to be taken to, to make sure that we can um, afford uh, a food supply uh, safe for everyone and at the same time and uh, having that not um, being uh, a barrier to trade but quite to the contrary being something that supports uh, trade. Um, for us it as you may have read it all starts at, it all has to start at national level we need to make sure that at national level there are uh, food safety capacities uh, national food control system that are able to ensure uh, an adequate safe food supply for the national domestic market and eventually that will be uh, essential then to also go to international market um, we do then uh, of course also need uh, uh, an, inter an intergovernmental and multi-state stakeholder engagement um, uh, that happens also at international level. And that's where, for example, a platform like the Codex Alimentarius, it's a, it's a unique forum where countries, member states can actually come together, agree, discuss on standards there uh, becomes then, as we said, benchmark uh, for international uh, trade uh, agreements. Um, for those standards, though, to be um, recognizable, agreed, and supported by all, I think the fundamental aspect has to be that they need to be based on um, solid, sound science. And so we at FAO, together with WHO, we provide these joint scientific assessments that hopefully provide that sort of neutral platform on which then the standards can be built. Uh, we do provide scientific advice on a number of issues from chemical hazards to microbiological issues to aha, more ad hoc uh, type of issues, but we really cover the whole spectrum of food safety issues to make sure that again, our advice um, can provide um, a solid basis for the standard setting uh, development process. And last but not least, we all know that while the, the public sector is key because it provides that sort of official control framework that needs to happen um, at country and international level, at the same time, the, uh, the private sector is the one really involved in the food production and most of the time in, in, in the marketing of food. So there needs to be that sort of cross-cutting collaboration between pub public and private sector, making sure that the rules of the games are clear for everybody and there is a framework where those different players can can everybody can play their uh, their, their role um, moving forward I believe uh, it is important that um, some of the um, the new issues that we are seeing coming in food safety we stay uh, on top of that and we at a fail we try to do that we have also a program on foresight whereby we look at emerging issues in food safety and we try to provide an advice to Codex members and to members in general that it's um, uh, it's fit for purpose and also future proof. So we are aware of the issues that are uh, emerging and we try to have a, a proactive advice. We also support a lot countries in terms of capacity development, making sure that they have um, the food safety knowledge that is needed to engage in some of these international dialogues that are happening, for example, at WTO, but also at Codex, and making sure that country there is really 
a truly international participation in some of these uh, discussions. So we do help and support at different level. And of course, we are always happy to, to, to provide additional support as need be. Um, and again, recognizing that food safety is not a static attribute. It's something that is evolving with the time. And these times, as we all know, are, are, are time of, 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 of challenges. So we need to also uh, making sure that we, we are still able to provide an advice and a support that it's really helpful for, 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 for the members. Uh, I'll stop here in the interest of time, but of course, if there are any questions, I'm happy to, to, to try and respond them. Over to you, Pinar, thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Victorio. Uh, actually, we are almost uh, at the end of our session, but let me check whether we have any questions pending in the Q&A module. Um, please post your questions uh, to the Q&A module if you have in any case. Um, it seems not to be the case, uh, oh, wait, I think we have one question. Okay, uh, so we have one question in the Q&A module on fisheries. Uh, so this question will be to you, Odin. Uh, I'm reading it. The criteria of major fishing area is being used now in the fisheries negotiations at the WTO. Can FAO elaborate more in what these areas are and measures? How did how were they established? And what are the real borders between one and another area? This is a question from the permanent mission of El Salvador in Geneva. Okay, regarding the, um, the design and demarcation of the uh, fisheries areas, uh, these have been developed by FAO in close consultation with, uh, with our members and with national and, and regional authorities. Um, we use them internally in FAO for reporting uh, purposes, statistical purposes only, um, to report on activities and catches and economic activities, etc. But in particular, of catches in, in those areas. But I would not go beyond that. So the areas are instruments in order to report and communicate catches taking um finding taking place in, in, in those areas. But for example, for, for, for FAO, uh, we are not going beyond um, the, the, the statistical reporting uh, when, when we use those, those areas, of course. Um, if, if I could understand a little bit more uh, the question, the background for the question and, 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 uh, and, and why, um, you, 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 uh, or, or what you expected me to to say in particular of 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 the how this could be better used, for example, and and how we we can communicate um, more and and better the activities in terms of catches that are taking place in in these within these areas, but but again, it's not it's it's not areas that have been uh, decided by FAO alone, designed together for reporting purposes, statistical purposes, together with the, the members of FAO and, and those that are operating in, in those areas, of course. Uh, thank you very much, Odin. Um, I don't see any questions and we are uh, running over time actually. So I, I must close the Q&A session, this, quick, this short Q&A session. Uh, but if you have any questions or comments, please do not hesitate to reach out to us and we will be happy to follow up on them uh, in due course. So let me wrap up the session right now. Um, excellencies, distinguished delegates, participants, and dear colleagues, uh, we would like to ex I would like to express my sincere gratitude to our colleagues from Rome who dedicated their time today to be with us. I would also like to thank our colleagues in FAO's Marcus and Trade Division and in the Geneva office for organizing this session. Last but not least, we would like to thank your participants for taking your time and joining this session. Before closing the session, I would like to take this opportunity to announce some upcoming work on our site. The new editions of the two of the FAO flagship reports will be published this year. The first one is the 2024 edition of the State of World Fisheries and Aquaculture, known as SOFIO 2024, and it will be released around June. And this year's edition will be on blue transformation and blue transformation in action. And as Georgios mentioned in the, in the very beginning, the 2024 edition of the State of Agricultural Commodity Markets, known as SOCO 2024, 
will be released in September. The theme of this edition will be Food Trade and Nutrition, Policy Approaches for Healthy Diets. While we will be starting our FAO in Geneva Agriculture Trade Talks and FAO in Geneva Fisheries Trade Talks for 2024, following MC13, next week on Tuesday, 30th of January, we are organizing an event on COP28 outcomes, addressing climate change through agri-food system transformation at 3 p.m. Geneva time. The invitation has been already distributed. However, should you need further information on registration, please do not hesitate to reach out to us via email. We would also like to inform you that the trade policy briefs presented today will be soon published in all six official UN languages, and we will be distributing those with you in due course. I would, look, I would like to thank you once again for your participation, and I wish you all a very nice day. Thank you very much.